what do we really need to leave when we practice Zen? Must we leave anything? Or maybe better still, can we by ourselves leave anything? One way of digging into this question may be for us to see as clearly as possible what we want out of the practice. What are we seeking? To what goal or end do we tie down our practice? Do I want to become a better person? Am I using the practice to become a more patient, understanding, or loving person? Or do I feel that I lack something fundamental and that practicing Zen will mend me in some way? Or am I hoping that practice will eventually solve all my emotional problems and bring me peace of mind and security? Or am I running after awakening in the hope that it will empty me of all pain? What we are seeking, if anything, and we must honestly and sincerely see what it is in the depths of our own heart is what we must leave behind. The setting in which we do this, be it in a monastic or lay life, be it true Zen or any other form of spiritual practice is quite secondary. We simply must do it where we are. In his introduction to the sayings of Layman Pang, Jeff reminds us that, and I quote, the fundamental way of the Buddha has always flowed freely and been, av been available to all people. Nothing institutional or otherwise can really obstruct it, end of quote. In his record, Master Rinzai says, and I quote, just keep your mind from seeking and keep your mind serene and carefree. Cut off the delusion that is already in your mind. Don't allow more delusions to arise in you, end of quote. In other words, the seeking at itself must come to rest. Whatever we bring to the practice must eventually be left behind. But how can one actually do this? Well, we simply can't. How can one seek not to seek? Here, we can clearly see how the self can become entangled in itself, running in circles, trying to outrun itself. We then try to control our practice, search for techniques, shortcuts, using koans to reach something, observing and controlling each breath, hoping that by doing this, we will finally get somewhere. But where to? In verse 15 of its selected verses, Layman Pang tells us, and I quote, difficult, so difficult, trying intentionally to get free of desires, you covet nirvana. You just seek the pure land everywhere else. If it's a question of true practice, you're not concerned with it. Uselessly striving, your coming and going is painful until at last you empty forms 
and return home. End of quote. One day in Dokusan, my late teacher told me, you know, Louis, you will never make it. It took years before these words could finally reach my heart and bones. It is not by concentrating on not seeking that the seeking mind comes to rest. It is by releasing all that one seeks, by befriending it all, and by humbly letting it melt and dissolve in its own time and of its own accord, not rejecting anything and not holding on to anything, trusting deeply that the Buddha way is flowing freely in each of us and that if we patiently let it work its way through us, it will take us home. And then what will we have left behind? There always seems to be something demanding our attention, something that cannot wait to have our engaged focus. Thoughts, perceptions, impulses, emotions. The effort or will to give focus and attention to all of this is constant for most of us. A stubborn habit, you could say. This constancy of focused effort and deliberate attention creates the illusion of a standalone locus or point of outlook. Simultaneously, everything that arises is assessed and given an emotional label, however subtle, reinforcing the illusion, my experience, my perspective, my opinion, my life. The tunnel vision of the ego self, what Lehman Tang called the will to survive. True practice is not a transaction. It is not something we do to get something in return. Rather, we must give up this idea of focus and effort. We must fall out of both of them and instead dissipate into or surrender to effortlessness, to where phenomena don't stick or get any traction. We must embody what Lehman Pan called the one with no connection with the 10,000 dharmas. My Grandfather was a priest in the Swedish Protestant church. I was just a small schoolboy when he lost his voice because of cancer surgery. In fact, I cannot remember the sound of his voice before this. Of course, he could no longer preach or conduct services, so he assisted other priests in the ways he could. I never saw him put down or in any way seem burdened by what had happened to him. On the contrary, I was surprised that there didn't seem to be any sorrow or sadness on his part. Instead, he was totally at ease as far as I could tell, collected 
and content, as it seemed, smiling and with a great sense of humor. I would say that he was my most important role model growing up. Sadly, I myself hadn't matured enough to ask him the most important questions before he passed away. But I'm very grateful for all the small memories of him, the way he conducted himself, how he met and treated others. I think of him as a man that made significant insights through his life and that he had found his way home. I believe that he gave me the first glimpses of what true compassion and selflessness look like, although I could not quite understand this at the time. Sometimes I view these memories as guiding lights on the way to be seen through ultimately. I'm a blue collar worker. I do quite strenuous physical labor. Focusing on the strenuousness of it makes all sorts of opinions, attitudes and wishes pop up. All with an emotional resonance that can be quite intense. Almost like a swarm of angry bees around my head. Like if something is at stake, at the risk of being lost and needing protection. Like there is a too big an expenditure. Phenomena sticking and getting traction. Self asserting itself. The will to survive. When this is killed off, as Layman Pang recommends, there is no one there to wish for things to be any other way. And so it all falls into place naturally and effortlessly, even in the midst of strenuous labor. Nothing to leave, nothing to arrive to. I was reading Lehman Pang and uh, thinking about leaving home and what does that really mean? And I, I came across the words of the Buddha, according uh, Gautama Buddha, according to the Dhammapada, uh, just after his enlightenment. And uh, I'm sure you've read those words before, I have too. But for the first time, uh, it struck me, this is a, a person, this was a person who had really left home. Here's what the Buddha said. Through birth after birth, I wandered without rest or reward in search of the house builder how hard it was to be born again and again. But now, house builder, you've been seen. You will not build another house. All of the rafters are broken. The ridge pole is destroyed. And the mind free at last has come to the end of craving. everyone and uh, thanks for the wonderful presentations. Um, as someone who took the formal Tokudo Shiki a few years ago, uh, I was reflecting on this. To me, these things are very personal rather than cultural or maintaining certain traditions, but uh, it came out of a time of my life a few years ago when I had moved country from 20 years in the States, living in a lay Zen community back to Australia, going through a divorce, uh, single parenting for a while, and my son leaving home, 
having to start a career again. So I'd lost a lot of my professional status and so on. Um, a loss of money, I was broke and I was in hospital. So I'd lost my health. And uh, at the time it was um, not so much a matter of what, what to leave behind. It was it felt, felt like it was all being taken away from me. But a word at the time that was very useful was ownership. I felt that I had some sense of ownership over all of these things which was a really useful way of me seeing uh, uh, the construction of a self as owner of all of these various things. And so that led to me going to uh, reconnect with the head of the Koktaiji Zen temple where I'd spent some time in 1982 and to spend some time with him and the following year with Jeff, uh, which helped resolve some of these questions. But I thought I'd just add the word of ownership in there because it was very useful to me at the time. Can you hear me okay? Good to see you in your robes, uh, Greg, especially since we're talking about lay practice today. Thank you for that. Uh, as Juliana made clear and the other presenters have really illuminated, huh? today the theme is leaving home or leaving the world, what that really is and what we really need to leave. The presenters, each in their own way, have already given us much uh, gems to consider well in our practice based on their own experience. Also the comments of David and Greg, I'm very grateful. I'd like to begin with a uh, Zen quote. Don't abide, that is, don't stay or get stuck. Don't abide even where Buddha is. Run right by where Buddha is not. Again, don't abide even where Buddha is. Run right by where Buddha is not. This is both a capping phrase and it's found, for example, a variation of it in the Blue Cliff Record. In a sense, it's all right there. But let's go back to the beginning. I want to put this leaving home in Japanese, shuke, literally, to leave home or to go forth from home to homelessness. What this means in context a bit. We're all familiar from our reading just over a year ago, our first readings, from the Pali Sutras about Gotama Buddha's great renunciation, renouncing his leaving home in a very literal sense, huh? leaving the world. It is a foundational idea in Buddhism. Huh? As David very well mentioned, David McCulloch, huh? the classic statement of Gotama Buddha's awakening is actually describing the utter destruction of the foundations that support a house, as David just quoted. House builder, you have been seen through. This house you will not build again. The first patriarch of the Zen tradition in India, Maha Kashapa, famous, infamous for the flower sermon, among other things. Maha Kashapa was renowned, famous for his austerities, his strict discipline. It's one natural direction in developing this notion in what was then a new religion, how to practice, how to leave the world. Hmm? For example, what Mahakashapa was great at, formulating or helping to formulate the rules or the precepts, what came to be the Vinaya for the monks. Very simply, there's about 250 of them for monks that they are supposed to keep. And there are about 100 more for nuns, for women. 
But the basis of that seems to be very early on what were called the four supports that everyone who had left home as a Buddhist from, it seems, Gautama's time was expected to maintain. These four supports are, you beg for your food, for clothes, for robes, only discarded rags. You live and you sleep under trees. You practice there as well. And for medicine, if you need it, you use cow manure. Eventually, uh, you are not permitted to eat after noontime, which as you probably know, Theravada monks to this day keep. No solid food after noon. Uh, and you were to, of course, avoid all forms of entertainment. Hmm? Can't help but bow humbly in deep respect with tears in our eyes for that lifestyle, which at that time, at that place was quite natural. If we compare this with the recent references to Dog or to uh, Hakuin's Zazen Wasan or the song of Zazen, singing and dancing are the voice of the Dharma. This is sheer depravity in early Buddhism. We're going to have to return to that and see what that really means. Again, what do we here and now really need to leave? One way to put it might be self or self delusion, the self delusion that is the delusion of the self. In other words, not to abide, stay, get stuck, not to abide anywhere, not to take up residence, to reside. What eventually was criticized in Hockman's time as being a whole dwelling devil, huh? to abide somewhere, huh? even in the most wondrous, splendid place. It's clear, isn't it? Only self-delusion needs a place to run and hide. Only self-delusion needs to play hide and seek with itself. And in the end, we can't escape reality, can we? More importantly, we don't need to escape. When we realize that, we're really home free. We must be careful not to leave one home and then set up shop, as we say, in another even if it's called monasticism or taking refuge in the three treasures, a very early way of leaving home, the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha, to take refuge in the three treasures. What does that really mean? <laughs> is it setting up another shop or is it leaving? Finally, where do we reside? Where do we set up shop? Where do we take our stand or our seat? I took great encouragement from the following. <clears throat> Quote, skin, flesh, and the marrow in my bones may dry up, but without complete awakening, I will not leave this seat. End quote. This is a very classic statement of Gautama Buddha just before his awakening. And it's easy to misunderstand it as some kind of tremendous willful effort, but it's really putting an end to that. As I've mentioned before, what he really meant when he says, I will not leave this seat until I'm done is, I cannot, being honest and sincere with myself, I cannot leave this seat until it's done. That doesn't mean I can't go to the bathroom or get something to eat. <laughs> it means even when I do something like that, I'm not leaving the practice. I cannot. It's not that kind of thing. Another quote that was a great inspiration for me was mentioned by Shibayama in the first case of the Mumonkan, the gateless barrier. Quote, 
when your bow, you know, a bow and arrow, when your bow is broken and all your arrows exhausted, there, shoot, shoot with your whole being. End quote. This cannot be a mere idea in our heads, however encouraging, even a very enlightening idea. <laughs> When self-delusion dissolves, you find yourself fully here, here, freely coming and going where there is no coming and go. Here, free of lay or monastic Buddhas or sentient beings, living freely from here is the message of layman Pong. Did I get that pronunciation right, Julia? <laughs> it's the true importance, the import, the significance of leaving home. In a word, sit until you've seen through, then get up and do what needs to be done. As you may know, the translation was not very good in the book, so I corrected it a bit. But Layman Pang's dying words are, just see the emptiness of all that exists, but don't then take that emptiness as existing. <laughs> Dahui, Dae, who we took up recently, huh? said, if you penetrate those two lines, your lifetime of training is done. Again, Pang's dying words. Just see the emptiness of all that exists, but don't then take that emptiness as existing. Returning to my first quote, don't abide even where Buddha is. Run right by where Buddha is not. <laughs> I would put it, Leave all behind, leave all delusion, ignorance behind, and don't be blinded even by the light of pure wisdom. That's how being without self works. How could it be any other way? Being without self naturally works and plays in the world. This is the work of love. <clears throat> compassion, right here, underfoot, at home, anywhere. <clears throat> I recently came back from two months in Hungary and I had to spend six nights in self-isolation <clears throat> in a hotel at the airport in Osaka, Japan. It was a great experience. Uh, I didn't leave the room once because they recommended you don't. So I said, fine, great. I've always wanted to do this, a little session on my own. But I realized anyone who has given themselves to real practice, for example, in a Rohatsu session knows space and time are not real hindrances. Neither are the demands of a lay life. Finally, what is it to leave the world? I'd like to quote, Feelings are expressed in speech. When that won't do, we draw out the words with a sigh. When that won't do, we break out in song. And when even that won't do, hands and feet leap up and dance, end quote. This is from the great preface to the Book of Songs, also translated the Book of Poetry or the Book of Odes. It's all the same in classical Chinese. This is the first anthology, so to speak, of Chinese poetry. Singing and dancing are <laughs> the true and living Dharma. Huh? As Layman Pang put it, fetching water and carrying firewood. For us, perhaps, remem remembering to uh, turn off our computers. I trust it's clear, especially from the other presentations, huh? what it is to really leave home and what we really do need to leave. 
what has already been left. Uh, thank you to the other presenters and Juliana for her gracious hosting and to all of you for being here.